Well, I want to share with you this morning about remembering and discerning and obeying your calling from God. The last week of April, our association pastors got away for a few days together to seek the Lord and seek renewal in our calling. It was about three days of spending long periods of time alone with the Lord, a lot of time of silence and solitude, and prayer, scripture reading, worship, journaling. Why did we do that? We did that because we kept hearing from pastors who are stepping down from ministry during this season, and those who are staying in ministry but are burned out and weary in the work. And so our association board decided that the best thing that we could do for our pastors this year was to help them remember their calling from God and renew their commitment to that calling. Now, for me personally, it was one of the most powerful encounters with the Lord I've had in a long time. God was so good and kind to refresh my soul, speak to my heart, show me his faithfulness and how he's been guiding me over these last 25 years. And I have said to hundreds of church planters over the years that they needed to be certain that God had called them to the work of starting a new church. Why? Because some days in life, all you have is your call from God. Some days, all you have is your call, and that has to be enough. As we celebrate our seniors today, I thought it was an appropriate Sunday to reflect on God's calling. Obviously, seniors are seeking to discern the Lord's direction in their lives. But the truth is, is that all of us need to be reminded of the Lord's call. At the beginning of your journey with God, you ask the question, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? But further along in your journey, you ask a different question. God, do you want me to keep doing the work you've called me to? Or is there something else you have for me? I know that when I went into that retreat a month ago, I was asking God that question. God, I've given 20 years of my life to vocational ministry. What do you want me to do with the next 20 years of my life? I went in praying, getting still with God, saying, God, my, my hands are open. My heart is ready to receive. My mind is listening to you. What do you want me to do? What did the Lord say to me while I was away? He said, Keith, stop looking for a different calling. I've already called you. Instead, remember the calling I've placed on your life and obey it with all of your heart. This morning, I want us to look at the prophet Jeremiah and his call from the Lord. I wanna share with you some important insights from Jeremiah chapter one, and I wanna make a few connections with my own walk with God and his call in my life. Why? Because my ultimate goal this morning is to help you discern God's call, remember God's call, and ultimately obey his call on your life. Now, I believe we have amazing giftedness, maturity, wisdom, and strength inside the City View family. Sitting in this room this morning, watching online today, are some of the most gifted, smartest, most humble, most courageous men and women that I know. But we have to align all of that underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ and his call on our lives. So I pray for you that you will have a soft heart today, an open mind and open hands with the Lord, that you would come with a posture this morning to God's word that says these things to God. Whatever you ask me to do, I will do it for you. 
That's the posture I'm asking from you this morning. God, whatever you ask me to do, I will do it for you. Will you stand with me as we open God's word to Jeremiah 1? Starting in verse 4, reading through verse 10. The call of God to the Jeremiah the prophet. The word of the Lord came to me. I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. But I protested, oh no, Lord God, look, I don't know how to speak since I am only a youth. Then the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth. For you will go to everyone I send you to and speak whatever I tell you. Do not be afraid of anyone, for I will be with you to rescue you. This is the Lord's declaration. Then the Lord reached out his hand, touched my mouth, and told me, I have now filled your mouth with my words. See, I have appointed you today over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and to demolish, to build and to plant. This is the word of the Lord to us today. You can be seated. Today I want to share with you about discerning God's call, how we protest God's call And finally, how to obey his call. Discerning his call, protesting his call, and obeying his call on our lives. First of all, how do we discern God's call on our lives? How does God speak to us today? I want to share with you two major ways in which God speaks to us his calling today. The first is through internal conviction from the Word and the Spirit. Internal conviction from the Word and the Spirit. This is why time alone with the Lord in prayer and fasting is so important. It's really hard, men and women, to hear God's voice when our minds and our souls are so noisy. If you never take a break from music, media, social media, if there's always noise in your head, it will be hard to hear the voice of the Lord. Now, Jeremiah, in our passage today, he hears an audible voice from the Lord. And sometimes God speaks to us today even in that way. But be very careful when you rely just on your internal sense of direction. In my own life, I've never heard an audible voice from heaven. I haven't seen the clouds part. I haven't heard, thus saith the Lord. So when I say to you, I've heard from the Lord, what do I mean? Because that's not what I mean. What I mean is I've had an internal conviction from the Holy Spirit that aligns with God's word. It would be nice if we had an audible voice that would speak to us. And I believe that God still speaks that way today, but rarely. Instead, God has said to us, he's given us his Holy Spirit who lives within us and he moves in our hearts, he convicts us and he moves us along by what he has said in his word. Let me say this a different way. How do we know our internal sense of conviction is from God? The first way is to make sure it is aligned with God's word. Write this sentence down. If it contradicts God's word, it's not God's voice. Write that down. I'm not joking with you. Write it down. If it contradicts God's word, it's not God's voice. If you believe God is calling you to steal money from your boss, that is not God's voice. Because God's word says, thou shalt not steal. If it contradicts his word, it's not his voice. What did God call Jeremiah to do? 
He called Jeremiah to be a prophet to the nations, to speak on the Lord's behalf, both warnings and blessings to his people. Old Testament prophets were called to be God's mouthpiece to God's people, calling them both to repentance, warning them of judgment, showing them what was to come in the future, and guiding their decisions. This was a high and a holy calling on Jeremiah's life, especially because so many people would hear his message, reject his message, and reject him as God's messengers. So many times in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah would go and say, thus saith the Lord, and what he was announcing was a coming judgment. What he was proclaiming was if they didn't turn and repent, what God was going to do to his people. And of course, the people did not like that message. They didn't want to hear that. And so they would raise up their own prophets who would tell them what they wanted to hear. And they would say, Jeremiah, you're not a prophet of the Lord. Look at these 10 prophets of the Lord over here who are all telling us we will be blessed and we will prosper and everything will go great in our lives. And Jeremiah was called to be that lone voice to speak the word of the Lord, even when people didn't want to hear. And of course, that calling did not go very well for Jeremiah. There were times in the book of Jeremiah where he is in the pit of despair. He wrote a whole book called Lamentations. Hello. He had a very difficult calling on his life, but God was clear. This is what I have appointed you, chosen you, set you apart to do. What did God call me to do? How did this work in my own life? I was under conviction even in high school by the Spirit of God for the work of ministry, but I didn't know what that meant. I didn't grow up in a ministry family. I didn't grow up around vocational ministry. So I resisted the call of God on my life to serve in pastoral work. To be honest with you, it really terrified me. I went to Baylor to study mechanical engineering. I knew that I was uh, good at math, and so of course my counselors and all those who were my teachers in, in school said, hey, you ought to go and be an engineer. It's a great future, it's a great career path, you can make good money and have a good job. But during my freshman year at Baylor, I was attending a college worship night at First Baptist Waco. There's about 1,500 college students that were packed into that place in attendance on a Monday night for worship. And during the time of worship, it was as we were singing praises to God, I came under overwhelming conviction from God. And the conviction was simple. You're not doing what I told you to do. You're not doing what I told you to do. I fell to my knees during worship and I stayed on my knees during the whole song service. To this day, I don't remember what the preacher preached on that night because I wasn't listening to him. I was wrestling with God. After the service ended, everybody left. They took off and I stayed in that seat for another hour, wrestling with God over my calling to vocational ministry. Finally, at the end of that evening, I surrendered and I said yes to God no matter the cost. In in addition to that internal conviction from the word and the spirit, God also uses, number two, external confirmation from the church family. He also uses external confirmation from the church family. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody agrees with your calling. Some will always push back or argue with you. To obey God's calling in your life, whether it was Jeremiah or whether it was my own story, you have to be willing to sacrifice the praise of other people. Some will never understand what you are doing. But you do need to hear from your spiritual family, the church. There is a very important role for spiritual mentors in your life. Spiritually mature, wise men and women who will give you godly counsel and encouragement. How does the church family confirm that you are hearing correctly from God? One, they confirm your gifting for the work. Two, they confirm that they see God's hand on your life in that area. And they come alongside you and they make sure that what you are discerning is actually from the Lord. So listen to this next statement carefully. We hear God's voice personally but we don't confirm his voice personally. We hear it personally, but it's confirmed in community. It's confirmed with men and women who are walking with you, who you trust are mature in the Lord, who are also discerning God's voice in your life. 
How did God confirm the call of prophets in the Old Testament when Jeremiah lived? Well, in Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22, the people were commanded, test the prophets. What did that mean? It meant that not everybody who said, I'm a prophet, not everybody who said, thus saith the Lord, was a prophet who was actually hearing from God. Some of them were just making up stuff. Some of them just wanted the title prophet. Some of them just wanted everybody to look at them and say, oh, that's a spiritual man or woman. And so they said, you gotta be discerning. God told his people, make sure you test the words of those that you're listening to to see if they really come true. There was a role for the people of Israel to confirm, listen to me, were these prophets really from God? How does God confirm the calling of ministers in the New Testament? Through the agreement of the elders and the laying on of hands of spiritual mentors. We see the spiritual leaders in the early church setting aside men and women in agreement with the Spirit for the work of the Lord. And so you see passages all through the book of Acts where they say it seemed good to the Lord and to us to set this person aside for this work of the ministry. The point is this. While you seek the Lord and you have the spirit, and you have the word, you're not the only one that has the spirit and the word. You hear me? The men and women around you also have the spirit of God, and they also have the word of God. And so, as you are seeking God, you wanna make sure that you have people around you who will tell you the truth, who will challenge you with things you need to think about, will help you see blind spots in your life, but will also encourage you when they are confirming with you God's call on your life. How did God confirm his calling for me? I had a youth pastor in high school. He was only with me for one year, Brent McKinney, and he was the one who led me to faith in Jesus. What's amazing is in that first year, I was a junior in high school, he encouraged me also in ministry. This is in my first year of following Jesus. I remember going on a band trip my junior year of high school, and he asked me to lead a Bible study one morning on the beach for all the students who were there who wanted to come early one morning. I have no idea why he asked me to do that. I don't know what he saw in me. I had never led anything like that before in my life, but it made a big impact on me. The most powerful moment came when my dad, who originally was skeptical of my surrender to vocational ministry, I've shared the story before that whenever I told him that I was changing from engineering to pursue a call to ministry, that he struggled with that. He was unsure about that. He said, well, I'm not sure what that's gonna mean for you financially, what that's gonna mean for your career. And when I first told him about that, he was concerned. But about a year later, he came to hear me preach one Sunday at a small church. After I preached, he came up to me after that message and he told me, this is what you're supposed to do with your life. What powerful confirmation from God. Now, even when we get clarity about God's calling, we struggle to obey. Just like Jeremiah, we discern, we hear, we receive, but then we protest. Come on, church. Let's be honest this morning. We protest. And Jeremiah protested against the Lord. What were the reasons he protested against the Lord? And what are the reasons we resist the Lord's call on our life? Well, the first reason is because of our bias toward no instead of yes. Come on, write this down. This is good stuff this morning. Our bias toward no instead of yes. I love Jeremiah 1 verse 6. But I protested Oh no, Lord God. At least he's honest. God said, I have a mission for you. I've appointed you. I've called you. I've set you apart. And what is his instinct? What's his first reaction? Uh, No, that's not going to work. Look at Jeremiah's oh no moment with God. Think about your time where you have said no to the Lord. His first response is not, yes, Lord, whatever you want. His first response is, oh, no, God, I can't do that. We have to be aware of our bias toward no when it comes toward God's call. For some of us, we think our no is attached to that we don't know what the call is. That's why I started with discerning through the spirit, through the word, through community. But listen to me. Some of you know what God's call is and you still are saying no. You're deceiving yourself thinking it's because you don't know what it is. 
But I want to tell you the truth. Many times we know it and we don't want it. Oh no, Lord God. Why do we have a bias toward no when it comes to God? Because we want to be in control. We want to be in charge of our lives. So when God calls, our first response is to think of all the reasons we can't obey. I understand this bias, friends. I am a human being. I have struggled with it my whole life. Every time I have sensed God's calling, I have wrestled with submission. I've wrestled to say yes. I just want to say to you at the first part, watch out for that knee-jerk no. Before you've prayed about it, before you've talked to anybody about it, before you've really wrestled with it, just watch out for your knee-jerk reaction is no to God. Second, we protest the Lord's call because of our inability to fulfill the calling. Do you see what he says right after that? He says, oh no, Lord God, I don't know how to speak. Now this would seem to be a problem if your calling was to be a prophet. (laughs) God commissions him. I've appointed you. I've set you apart to speak on my behalf. And Jeremiah's like, well, I have one problem. I can't speak. I don't like speaking. My words get all jumbled up. I get nervous when I get in front of people. I don't like crowds. You guys know public speaking is like always one or two when it comes to people's like greatest fears in life. You can hear that in Jeremiah when he says this. I don't know how to speak well. And let's just give him the credit to think that he's telling the truth, right? Let's just give him the benefit of the doubt that says, really, he doesn't know how to speak. That he's not lying to God, that what he's confronted with is he doesn't have the ability within himself to do what God has called him to do. But listen to me carefully. One of our elders said this Sunday, and I want you to remember this. God does not need our ability. He needs our availability. He doesn't need our ability. He needs our availability. I think the struggle for all of us is we compare our calling to our gifting, and we freak out. Here's what you've called me to do. Here's what I know how to do, and my heart fails because I can't do it. Sometimes we even compare our abilities to the abilities of others. Maybe Jeremiah heard this call, and he thought, well, I've I've heard some prophets speak, and that's not me. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you've compared yourself to other musicians, to other singers, to other speakers, to other Bible scholars, to other people who have called into ministry who are great one-on-one, pastoring, shepherding, making disciples. Maybe you compare yourself to somebody who's a great leader. Maybe you've watched somebody on YouTube and you said, I can't do what they do. So maybe your answer has been no, Because you don't think your ability measures up to what God has called you to do. Here's what I want to say to you, the truth over you. None of us, none of us have what it takes to fulfill our calling. None of us. I didn't grow up around ministry. I didn't have a lot of Bible knowledge when I started. I didn't have any experience in public speaking. It still freaks me out with all you looking at me right now. Stop looking at me. I didn't know if I could lead well. I didn't have any skills that I have now when I started in ministry. If you're saying to me, oh, of course you should be a pastor because you're looking at me at 43, you should have looked at me at 19 when God called me to ministry because I didn't have anything that I have now when I was 19. You see, the calling comes when you don't know what you're doing, when you don't have the ability. Because if you had the ability to do it, it wouldn't take any faith to step out and obey the calling. Because you'd be like, of course, God, I know how to do that. Sure, I'll do it. No, but the invitation is for you to trust him that he's going to equip you and give you what you need to do what he's called you to do. So are you going to do that? If we're waiting to be perfectly equipped before we say yes to God, you will never say yes. How many people have I asked over the years to lead a small group? Oh, I don't, I'm not good with the Bible. I, I, somebody's going to ask me something I don't know how to do. How many people have I asked to lead a ministry? How many people have I said, hey, get in there and disciple kids. Get in there and disciple students. Oh, I don't know how to do that. I'm not good with children. Listen, we all have our excuses. 
of why we can't serve God. We all have our reasons we're not equipped to do what God's called us to do. But listen to me, if you are waiting to be perfectly equipped before you say yes, you will never say yes. The second and the final third reason we protest God's call is because of our insecurity about ourselves. I know this sounds like the second one, but it's a little bit different. The first one, he just instinctively says no. The second is he says, I can't speak. But the third one is he says, because I'm too young. I can't speak because I'm too young. Jeremiah fears that no one will listen because of his youth. And I just want to say over you, sometimes it is our lack of confidence in our gifts. But sometimes it's our insecurity about who we are. Not our abilities, but just who we are as a person. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too tall. I'm too short. I've been doing other things in ministry. I've never done that before. I don't have any experience. Nobody would listen to me. I've got this sin in my past. Why would God call me to do anything in ministry? He wouldn't ask me to do that. We have this insecurity within ourselves. Watch out, friends, for the lie that you can't serve God because something is wrong with you. We discount our usefulness to the kingdom because of our insecurity. Friends, I have been here so many times as a pastor. No one will let me be a youth pastor because I've never done that before. No one will follow me as a lead pastor because I look so young. This is why I love this passage from Jeremiah. It's funny that the Lord brought me back to this passage this week because when I first did ministry to teenagers when I was in college, I just turned 20 years old. I was traveling around this little summer revival team ministering to students. And as I would minister to them, I would always, every week, I would go to Jeremiah 1, and I would say to them, don't let anybody tell you you can't serve God because you're young. Students, you hear me? Don't let anybody tell you you can't serve God because you're young. Paul said the same thing to Timothy, doesn't he, in the New Testament. Don't let anybody look down on you because of your youth, but set an example for the believers in all the ways you live your life. Hundreds of people over the years, some in seriousness, some in jest, have told me I looked too young to be a senior pastor. If I had listened to those voices, I would have never planted this church, and I would not be standing before you preaching this morning. Watch out for the narratives that you believe about yourself that talk you out of obedience. God has no patience with Jeremiah's excuses. And he doesn't with us either. He invites Jeremiah to obey, full stop. All of those objections and protests are real, but they're not ultimately the primary issue. The primary issue for all of us in this room is will we obey God's call? God commands us to obey. Let's don't make it hyper-spiritual. Let's don't make it real complicated. You don't need to go to a seminary class. You don't need to do a research paper. It's really, really simple. Will you obey? God commands us to obey his call. Look what he says to the prophet Jeremiah in verses seven and eight. He says, don't say you are too young, for you will go and you will speak. (laughs) Now, let me just say something here to this. I'm gonna read into these future verbs a little bit, but I don't think it's that far of a stretch. I personally believe that what God is telling Jeremiah is, is you can go now or you can go later, but you're going to (laughs) go. That's what I think he's saying by saying you will go and you will speak. 
And so it's an invitation to Jeremiah, do you want to obey now or do you want to disobey and I'll discipline you in your disobedience and then you will obey? Choice is up to you, Jeremiah. He commands us to obey. God doesn't want our excuses as his kids. He wants our full surrender. I went into this April pastor's retreat looking for a new calling. God, I'm 20 years into this calling. What do you want me to do, Lord, with the next 20 years? God, do you have a different calling for my life? Just sitting still with him, journaling, praying, asking God, I'm ready. Where's the new calling? And his voice was so loud and so clear and so loving, I've already called you, obey my call. As I look back over the last 20 years of ministry, I remembered the times when God met with me personally and showed me an additional part of my calling. But never did he revoke the calling. He simply added clarity to it. The picture God gave me while I was gone was that understanding his call in my life was like building a puzzle. And that all along the way, God was giving me one piece at a time. He would add this piece. Three or four or five years later, he would add this piece. A little while later, he would add this piece until eventually I could see the bigger picture of what he was asking me to do. I asked the Lord, why did you do it like that? And I felt like God was kind to show me that if he had showed me the whole picture all at once, I would have said no. But because he gave it to me piece by piece, he was patient with me as a father is with a son to help me receive it and obey it and walk in it. For me personally, as I look back over my journey with God, the Lord Jesus graciously, graciously called me over the years saying these things to me. Here's my puzzle pieces. Keith, explain the Christian faith clearly so others can understand it. Two, partner with Barry to serve me. Love her well. Three, surrender your vocation to me and trust me with your finances. Fourth, preach my word soaked in prayer. Five, Plant a church planting church that's part of a movement to reach the city. Six, build a Christ centered, multi ethnic, intergenerational church family. Seven, help hurting marriages heal with the gospel. Eight, serve other pastors and help them obey their calling. Now let me be brutally honest with you for just a minute about how hard this calling has been to obey. I was just searching the Lord at this moment and um, I've wrestled about whether to say this part, okay? Just to be transparent with you. Because uh, I, the Lord knows my heart I'm not seeking, like, sympathy. Um, many of you in this room, you have very, very difficult things that you're walking through. That, that's not why I'm saying this. But I just want to be, I feel compelled by the Spirit to be fully honest with you for a minute about my calling. Those eight things I just read to you. The toll of this calling on my physical, emotional, and spiritual health has been immense. I have walked through uh, betrayal, slander, loss of friendship, lack of time with my family, overwhelming grief, intense stress and conflict, disappointment, a discouragement, exhaustion, heartache, financial fear, Endless criticism, 
conflict, sleeplessness, and wondering if I was even making an impact. The Lord said to me in April, Keith, I called you to vocational ministry 25 years ago. 25 years later, Keith, knowing what you know now regarding all the cost involved with this call, would you still say yes? And I said through tears to the Lord, of course, Lord, I would say yes. A thousand times I would do it again. Because you are the one God who calls. And all I want to be is in the center of your will. Just like me and you, the Jeremiah, the prophet, had low points in his calling. I take great comfort in that he wanted to quit. In fact, in Jeremiah 20, verses 7 and 8, can I just read it to you? <laughs> He says, you deceived me, Lord, <laughs> and I was deceived. You seized me and prevailed, and he says, I am a laughing stock all the time. Everyone ridicules me, for whenever I speak, I cry out and I proclaim violence and destruction, so the word of the Lord has become my constant disgrace and derision. So he's done. It's just been too hard. And so he says at the beginning of verse nine, so I say, I won't mention him or speak his name any longer. Jeremiah says, I'm out. It's been too hard. The cost has been too high. But the next sentence is this. But then his message becomes a fire burning in my heart shut up in my bones. I become tired of holding it in and I cannot prevail. He renews his yes to God he renews his yes to the calling because where else would he go? What else would he do? If you say yes to Jesus, just know sometimes you're gonna be like the disciples. You remember the story in the New Testament where Jesus starts teaching some really weird stuff? It's like a big crowd there. He says, if you wanna follow me, you have to eat my body and drink my blood. I'm not making this up. This is in the New Testament. And he starts saying those things, and slowly the crowd starts to depart. <laughs> this is weird. And finally, the text says he's just there with his disciples, and he says to them, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Peter says, where else would we go? For we believe you have the words of life. I think that's what Jeremiah's saying. That's what I say to God. What else would I do? Because you have put this in my heart. The reason we can say yes to the call is because God promises he will be with us when it's hard. He says to Jeremiah in verse eight, don't be afraid of anyone for I will be with you to rescue you. Jesus says it this way to his disciples in Matthew 28, 20, after he sends them out, remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So here's the invitation this morning. What is God calling you to that you are resisting? What is God calling you to do that you are saying no 
The God of Jeremiah is the God who first called the disciples, is the same God that called me, is the same God that's calling you. He's the same God. And he knows your name, he knows your story, he knows your sin, he knows your insecurities, he knows everything about you, but he is still calling. He is still asking, where are the men and the women who will surrender completely to his call? I know you're like me, that you struggle with yourself, you struggle with your choices, you struggle with your sins, you struggle with your experiences. You struggle with the times you have said yes to God and it hasn't worked out the way that you thought it would work out. But I wanna say to you this morning that God is calling, will you say yes? That he is inviting you to follow him. And I believe even as I've preached this morning, he's been reminding some of you of his call on your life. He's been reminding you of things he has said to you over the years, ways in which he's spoken to you. And even now as I'm preaching, you're sensing the Holy Spirit calling your name and saying to you, will you follow me? I believe every believer has a call on their life from God. Some of you are called to be his missionaries in your workplace. Some of you called to be missionaries in your neighborhood. Some of you are called to be the most amazing moms and dads and disciple the next generation to come up. Friends, he has called all of us to some part of his work. But I wanna specifically give an invitation this morning to those that are sensing a call to vocational ministry. I have never done this in 15 years at City View. I've never done this. But I sense God's prompting and part of the reason that he wanted to renew my call is because there's some of you in this room who are wrestling with a call to vocational ministry. That the Lord wants you to surrender to that call today and for you to put your yes on the table. I don't know who it is, but I just wanna be faithful and obedient to God in my life to give that opportunity. And to say to you, if you don't know what it is or what it means or how you'll do it, we will walk with you. We will help you. We will help you discern, we will help you get discipled, we will help equip you, we will help get you experienced and all that. But we can't do any of that if your yes is not on the table. And so the invitation is for you to put your yes on the table with God. Will you bow with me in prayer? Let me invite our, our elders and our staff and our prayer team down front. I want us to be available to you this morning to pray with you during this time. And so I'm gonna pray for you. And if the Lord is speaking to you this morning, if he's working on your heart, you sense that call on your life, you sense that call to ministry, would you come forward? Would you be bold this morning to step out and come forward and let us pray for you? God, I pray right now for every person who is listening to this message. God, I pray that you would speak to every heart, every mind. And God, I pray as you call that you would give us the courage to obey. Father, I believe that there are some decisions in this room right now that are gonna impact future eternity. And so God, I pray right now, give us the courage to step out. Give us the courage to say yes, the courage to obey no matter the cost. And so Lord Jesus, have your way in this place. Move now in this response time. And God, would you call the men and women down front who are surrendering to you today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.